Welcome, everybody. It's Chris and John. We are back for another edition of Watch This Space, our monthly podcast. And uh, let me get Chris on the call here. We've got a couple of things to talk about here. So, Chris, welcome back. How are you doing? Oh, hi, John. Great to be here again. All good. And hi, everybody. Great to be back. Yeah. So I could say let's just stop right now. And anyone who noticed anything different, I'll give you three seconds to think about that. Now, you may not notice anything different, but we are on our journey, Chris and I here, of uh, upgrading what we're doing, uh, both production-wise, technically, and uh, just overall the process that we're following here to produce our podcasts. So, Chris, you noted, I think, last month that that was our 25th episode. Is that right? Yes, it was. It was our 25th. So we're, 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 we're getting the hang of it, I think. And uh, if you follow our podcasts, you'll probably notice that we recently uh, updated our visual look. We have a, a bit of a, a logo, a graphic, and we are, we've kind of settled on this name of Watch This Space as the moniker for these podcasts that we've been doing steadily now. So better part of two years, maybe just a little more, Chris. So uh, here we are. So we're Kind of, I guess we are going into our third year, so uh, we've survived, we've managed, but I think more importantly is we're moving ahead and uh, updating it, making it a better experience for everybody. Well, John, when we started, I think it was just an experiment. So we were kind of making use of what I would call standard teleconferencing technology or video conferencing technology without the video to record it, and then some very basic post-production ultimately just publishing it on YouTube rather than making it an actual published syndicated podcast. So we're starting out this month with some new tools, uh, both for recording and for publishing. So bear with us, but hopefully we'll be out there on, uh, on, the, on the podcast platform. And maybe you can say a little bit about that, John. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Chris, I think we're pretty excited about this. So the First of all, we're using, a, as, you, as you say, a purpose-built uh, recording platform called CleanFeed. And the audio, certainly from our ears, is markedly better. We're still evolving, by the way. Uh, I'm going to be getting a better microphone for this. So probably starting next month, you'll see an even higher quality in our audio. And from there, we are going to be uh, uh, using a proper hosting platform for the podcast. And from there, the, will, the finished products will find their way out into the podcast sphere. And so it'll, it'll turn up in all the regular channels, Stitch and uh, uh, iTunes, et cetera, et cetera. So this will be uh, kind of a big leap for us, getting beyond our small base in our circles from the newsletter. And in time, the podcast, I think, is going to uh, have its own life in terms of being part of the newsletter, but also independent so uh we're we're kind of experimenting right chris we'll we'll see where the market takes us in terms of how we use this platform but for now we'll continue this monthly format and uh it will keep evolving that's right john and it's going to be interesting to see what if any larger audience that we're able to tap and who they might be and where they might come from as opposed to your newsletter subscribers yeah, yeah, and so uh, certainly with 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 uh, with, with uh, no reservations, we, we, we'd be remiss not to mention if for anyone out there who likes what we're doing, and wants to uh, get behind our efforts. Uh, yes, we would be happy to talk about sponsors who are interested in uh, in getting their name associated with us. If it makes sense, we'll make that decision. But. Uh, I think the idea is that we want to make this a more available, more accessible platform to share our views. And in time, as we've talked, Chris, right, having guests on this uh, on this uh, platform and uh, doing more than just what we're doing today. Yeah, I think so, John. I also think that our area, which is sort of that combination of future work and workplace technology, has really grown in the two years since we started it. And there are all other areas uh, now associated both with the current situation and the redesign of things going forward. So hopefully we'll have new and different topics to talk about as well as our usual focus on collaboration and workplace technology. Yeah, yeah. And certainly the 
future of work theme that we've kind of settled on recently, a lot of that future is here today and we're living it. And what's so interesting, I think, is how we've adapted, I think, a lot of us pretty easily to these new tools. And that says a lot about, A, how user-friendly the technologies have become, and B, how uh, stable, how uh, supportive the cloud platforms have become. Nothing has, seems to have crashed the internet during this you know, work from home pandemic phase that we're kind of going to be stuck in for a while now. And that's a really good sign because if the cloud wasn't up to snuff, you know, we wouldn't be getting a lot of work done right now, right? No, that's true. That's true. But, uh, but it's also reinforced the need for more universal broadband, more universal access to technology, um, especially when it comes to things like education and um, not everybody being in the same position to have technology or connectivity. You know, how do you equalize that out a little bit? And, and how do you make these tools more universally available? But the tools themselves, when they can be deployed and the connectivity when it can be deployed, has shown to be pretty successful. Uh, I don't know about the real long term, John, about how people are going to deal with a really long term uh, trend toward not being able to access the workplace or really being limited in their person to person interaction but I guess we'll see. Yeah, I think a long-term benefit of this is we think about digital transformation and future of work through the lens of the workplace. And that translates primarily into the knowledge worker. And we know that's just a segment of the workforce. But as with a lot of things that we're going through in this pandemic, we're questioning a lot of things about our kind of our economic structure, distribution of resources, access to things like internet. And I, it's bringing a lot of these issues, I think, to the fore that are beyond just getting stuff done at work. And you mentioned, you know, education, healthcare, government services, etc. And it really, uh, I, I think it's really going to put a lot of focus on the idea that, you know, as infrastructure grow, as infrastructure goes, you know, internet, broadband um, needs to be something that obviously we've talked about as being a universal right, so to speak, and compared to the cost of building roads and bridges, airports, etc., internet infrastructure is really not that expensive. And when you think about the benefit is we not just have digital transformation of work, but digital transformation of our daily lives. And as the main channel through which things get done, it seems like a pretty good investment to, as you say, broaden that reach, make it accessible to uh, really almost anybody and everybody. And when you think of the benefits that can come from that, it's way beyond a few desk workers being more productive, right? For sure, John. I mean, I think, I think this difficult period has triggered a lot of why types of conversations. And that's kind of a new thing for work. You know, it, it was sort of more like what for a very long time. But, you know, if you're really going to reconsider how work is meaningfully going to change or any of the other aspects of the fabric of society or, or, or institutions, you need to think, well, why? Why were they the way they were? And there's been, especially with work, it's, it's really been in a similar way for a very, very long time. I would say even knowledge workers, uh, and it kind of just blithely went along for a long time in terms of you're basically sitting in front of a computer or talking or on the phone or video conference. That is the, that's the gist of what you do. That's the gist of your job in a lot of knowledge worker type jobs. And so, you know, why you do that in a particular location, why you go to a particular location, why you're using a particular piece of equipment, why you're doing that particular component of the job is all, I think, coming under some scrutiny. And it's going to be interesting to see what comes out. But I don't think it can be successfully addressed without really considering the broader questions that you mentioned. You can't just take one segment of an economy 
and 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 genericize that without i mean if you're going to be successful in moving forward you really have to try to think about the broader fabric so yeah well, i i i'm with you on that totally chris you know of all those big questions you know who what where when why is always my favorite because it's the one that you have to as you say fundamentally question everything that you're doing um mainly because a it's not working or b you're coming at the problem set from a different perspective and a lot of this of course is that digital divide between millennials and you know the digital immigrants and digital natives so to speak and um, I, I think a, a really good example is very timely in that you know recently uh late june uh slack announced uh, a new approach of what they're doing and they call it Slack Connect. And they made a big deal about it. And this company, for those who don't follow them very closely, have really kind of come out of nowhere in the last few years and have emerged as the dominant mode of what we call team collaboration or team messaging uh, platform, which is rooted entirely on a messaging basis as being the primary mode of communication, not voice, not email, and uh, the roots of it are pretty interesting. We've talked about Slack before, but um, the company has a lot on the line for its own future survival. And increasingly, it's becoming viewed as an either or for Microsoft Teams. And the company has been dancing this line for a long time. Are we friends? Are we foes? Are we co-op, co-optition, so to speak? So it's in a very interesting space for sure. But this announcement that they in particular has been building a long time and it's really set to draw you know a line in the sand about what the future of work in terms of the tools we use to collaborate are probably gonna look more like and less like other things well john the details of the slack announcement were basically that they allowed interorganization in multi-organizational federation right that 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 they basically allowed different organizations to have a recognized and managed way to interconnect was that it yeah yeah so you know i i think of you know with email for example i don't know what the numbers are but i suspect the majority of messaging we do on email is for external or personal purposes rather than internal communications within an enterprise or a business unit right I, well actually i think john it's a pretty even mixture in fact yeah in and it depends on the organization and email centric organizations it could be more even internal well than external and I'm, i've but no it doubt varies. it varies but also at least internally they have alternatives right to use whatever jabber or you know or yammer or whatever there are internal chat tools that they can use for that but those tools generally don't go outside the organization right they're closed so at least as an alternative. Right, right. And and there needs to be better ways to manage the borders between enterprises. Um, I mean, email is notoriously not good. You read the stories all the time about things getting out that shouldn't get out, and uh, there's really not much monitoring of it. And those companies that are email, organiza email using organizations that really try to get a handle on this problem the technology to try to sort of monitor things that go out plus the need for retention of everything is a gigantic expensive difficult problem and so there's been a quest for quite some time for years really to come up with better ways to uh, federate messaging so that you had the concept of borders and you had the concept of controls um, and authorization and identity and all of these things, um, but you were able to, uh, you were able, you were able still to be pretty seamless about it. It wasn't an interference to the people who were trying to use it to do their jobs. And that was one of the reasons that Symphony was founded. If you're familiar with them, mm -hmm. um, was really among the banks um, who needed a way to have safe and proven connectivity among different organizations that was monitored and controlled. Uh, and uh, it, it, it did pretty well. It's done pretty well with that. But there had been numerous attempts, and there still are numerous alternatives out there, 
to, to do that, uh, ranging from Bloomberg messaging on down through Reuters and a number of other companies that had tried to do that. And I'm sure if you looked in other industries, you would see similar things. But there's always been a need for this. So if Slack's able to do it across really a broad swath of the landscape versus very specific verticals, you would think that that would be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And Symfony is a great example, as you say, of a pretty much a vertical application, a vertical segment, also one that's highly regulated, right? That has to be very conscious of that idea of, of having, as you said, you know, safe federation where you can not get, not, not cross the boundaries of regulations, et cetera, you know, sharing improper information. Well, that's where it starts, John, is when you're under a lot of regulation. But really, if you think about a lot of what's kind of the wild and wild and wonderful world of messaging and unrestricted Slack, just think about things like intellectual property and think about things like, you know, inadvertently disclosing things, you know, or inappropriate or all kinds of stuff that it kind of doesn't matter what industry you're in. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you, you may not quite be subject to the same type of regulatory scrutiny, but a lot of industries actually are pretty regulated, particularly across across the world, and particularly when you think about things like data privacy and GDPR, GDPR. and other, other, you know, areas, the EU regulations, etc. And so the ability to have uh, managed communications across organizational boundaries is, is pretty attractive, you know, whether if you could do it without the cost and trouble that it takes to do it when you had to do it, when there weren't broad broadly available tools to do it does that make sense yeah it's definitely you know a healthy uh evolution right of of these things you know i think of email in a lot of ways like ps sorry like uh, uh pbx you know telephony barely evolved for decades you know but it had so much utility the internal phone system that it didn't need to change a whole lot because in that that in those modes of technology it was perfectly fine it did its job and it did it very very well and emails to me is very similar in the sense that it really has not evolved very much but it has so much utility and hasn't had any kind of real alternatives until you know recent years um it hasn't really had to change a whole lot and, but the problem is, that, you know, for many people, certainly in workplace, it's got more drawbacks than advantages. So you can see certainly the companies like Slack have recognized this and also the generation that's coming up now that is very text heavy. And, and you know, they, they, their degree of communication is, is pretty high. And if this is just a seamless way of sharing information and it works very well for them, and the more you do that, the you realize I don't really need that much email. And that's one of Slack's, you know, selling points is that companies that embrace this concept of channels find that their email use goes down in a big way. And you could argue, you know, is this going to be the email, you know, the killer app that kills off email, or is this just another way of working? Well, that's an interesting question and we'll see, but I have a slightly different view with that. I think what happened was that email was such a broadly useful tool and so widely available that it became the only tool. It was it was expanded to do so many things that it wasn't designed to do that um, it became a plague in a way, right? I mean, it just became, it was as if the only tool you had was a trowel. Hmm. And, you know, there's probably five or six things in the world that that's a great tool to do. You know, you're putting down a brick wall, you need the trowel. But, you know, you didn't have any screwdrivers or pliers, you know, so you had to use the trowel to try to loosen a screw. Hmm. And, you know, that doesn't work all that well. And then multiply that by thousands and millions of nuts and bolts. You yeah. know, so um, I, I think what's going to happen is that email kind of goes back to where where it, one of the reasons it started was to, it was an electronic memo where, you know, there are certain use cases where you want to instantiate something effectively in print. You want to, you know, codify something, you want to structure something. So it's not just going to be an ad hoc conversation, 
but taking all that ad hoc, endless CCs back and forth, somebody adds five words to an email chain, and putting that on a medium like Slack, where it's more more adapted to that kind of communications, that interactivity, probably will reduce the volume of email that really shouldn't be email, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure. And, and, it, and it will take root for Slack if, you know, the concept I think is pretty, is sound, this idea of going across up to 20 organizations. So, you know, it becomes a supply chain management tool, right? Because now you can create that circle of trust with everybody that you need to, and it becomes that single channel for doing everything. So it, 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 it makes a lot of sense, um, but it will only work, of course, if it is a trusted, like you said before, a trusted channel. So Slack's response to that is something called, they call enterprise key management. So that's their approach to making this a secure environment where people can kind of check that box and say, okay, we're fine. And, uh, but that feature hasn't been announced GA with this news. It's coming later this summer. That's kind of what their party line has been on this. So it's not quite there yet, but that's, I think, a big piece to this being successful. And just as someone who follows Slack as a company, of course, this is a very big deal because Slack, for, to, for it to grow and support the valuation it has in the market, um, with all the money it's taken to get to this point, it really needs to penetrate the enterprise market for growth. So they have, you know, tons and tons of customers, smaller businesses. Slack is a very kind of socially conscious company. It's probably like the dream place for a lot of millennials to work. Their culture is really, really cool. But, and they attract that kind of audience. But for them to hit that, you know, the real hardcore enterprise large scale button down environments, that's where the money is. And for them to really get those revenue streams going, they need a solution that's going to work and that they can be trusted with. So that's kind of the end game here. You know, whether it displaces Microsoft, uh, create it's gonna create friction for sure, because it's going to put companies in a position, do we find a way to live with both? Or do we see this as a replacement for a Microsoft you know, environment. I don't think that will, that will ever happen wholesale, but it, the point is, I think it's this, as I said before, this line in the sand, I think this is saying, okay, well, Microsoft has its desktop piece. We have our piece. We will find a way to coexist, but we believe our vision is kind of more suited to where we think workflows are going and what enterprises really need. We shall see, as you say. But it's one of these, as I said, this healthy evolution in the market where we need better tools like this. And whether this pushes email further into the background remains to be seen, you know. Um, but ultimately, it does make better communication, better collaboration. So it's hard to it's hard to knock it, right? I mean, that's why we're doing this these podcasts. This is where future work is going. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'll I'll make a I'll put out a thought that maybe we can talk about more next time. So I think, I think if I were to distinguish this era of technology for collaboration and office technology versus maybe the last, I think that when you talk about the 80-20 rule, when you talk about the majority of cases where there, you know, there aren't a lot of requirements that there are on the edges and where, where somebody has access to the basic necessary technology, whether it's a broadband, a computer, a tablet, a phone, whatever whatever it is that the person needs to operate it. I think that this problem of having this operate reliably and scalably has been basically solved. But I think that it's very much the sort of center of the stream, if you want to call it that. I think when you move toward the edges of the stream and you move to, towards some pretty big use cases that are not just the most simple use cases, there's still work to be done. And that's where trusted messaging and a lot of other technologies that are on the kind of forefront are going to play. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine if you just want to set up a Slack account, or if you want to set up an Office 365 account, and you're just kind of, you're, you're a small, medium business, maybe there you don't have a lot of out-of-the-ordinary security or content requirements, uh, or you don't publish or create content in different ways 
you're fine. You know, just the sort of the 80-20 rule or the 70-30. I think we've come a long way with that, but I think it's going to be where the frontiers are, where it's going to be really interesting, uh, whether that be in education, whether that be societally, adaptation of technology, or kind of our traditional area of knowledge worker. That's where the interesting stuff is going to be. Whereas 10 years ago, or five, you would have said there was a lot of work to be done just to create the generation of tools that became Slack. Um, and, and ultimately, Microsoft Teams, although uh, they had predecessors to that, as we know. Um, tools like we're using now, CleanFeed, right, Zoom, all of them had predecessors, but all of them were not that great to use kind of painlessly on a day-to-day -day basis where you had to have, train a lot of different people to use it. That, I think, has been really addressed still ways to go, but basically addressed. But I think it's now the enterprise applications that are really the challenge. I mean, what do you think? Agreed. And we have a front row seat. And that's uh, that's what makes these podcasts fun to do. Uh, Chris, I think that's a good way to kind of leave them waiting for more, because uh, there is more to talk about. And uh, we want to keep people's uh, time to a minimum here on our podcast and let you get on with your day. So I think with that, we're going to call it a wrap for this episode. But I think, yeah, as you say, we have more to get to. And yes, that uh, the edges of the stream are the, the interesting places to explore. So, yeah, we'll get there, right? Absolutely. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, we will sign off now. So thanks again as well from me, John Arnold, and my colleague, Chris Fine. All right, Chris, let's uh, sign off over and out, and we'll catch everyone on the next episode of Watch This Space. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, thanks again.